On a cold morning of November 30, 1700, the Swedish army deployed some distance from the city of Narva. Commanded by King Charles XII, the Swedes faced a Russian army outnumbering them at least three to one, commanded by the appointees of Tsar Peter, known to history as Peter the Great. The Russians deployed behind a long line of a well-prepared network of trenches and earthworks, a strong, defensible position. The Swedes, meanwhile, were weary and cold, having endured a difficult march in harsh winter conditions. They were now arrayed in the open, withstanding a heavy snowstorm. But the young, energetic Charles roused the men once more. To the sound of trumpets, he commanded a frontal assault on the entrenched Russian positions. The first major battle of the Great Northern War was about to begin. I have a sweet game to recommend to you today, World War Armies, a very well-made real-time strategic war game that you can play on mobile. Inspired by Company of Heroes and Steel Division, World War Armies is perfect for players who like RTS games and army simulators with amazing 3D graphics and precise units control. The PvP in the game is amazing. You can play against players all over the world, and in every match it's your strategy thinking skill that will matter the most in deciding who will win. My preferred mode is 1 vs 1, but you can invite a friend to play the new 2 vs 2 mode. Those are very popular lately. You can pick from several nations to play with, Germany, USA and USSR, each with their own unique units, totaling over 70 units of infantry and vehicles, from engineers, flamethrowers, rangers, jaegers and, of course, tanks. Each unit is specific, some can heal, others deal tons of damage, and others can tank a lot of punishment. Every match is unique, as no player will have the same deck, and you can play different styles depending on the army deck you create. Adding even more depth to World War armies are generals. Each unit has unique generals with their own abilities and skills. Some can launch airstrikes, some allow you to collect more resources in the battlefield, some improve maneuvering around buildings and rivers, while others can rush the enemy straight away. This enables you to choose your preferred playstyle and remain unpredictable to your opponents, from a slow-paced strategic battle to a fast, dynamic confrontation. Checking out World War Armies is a great way to help support my channel. It's totally free and definitely worth your time. Follow the link in the description and receive the Pershing tank and a desert skin with tokens immediately after finishing the tutorial. See you on the battlefield. By the dawn of the 18th century, Sweden was the mistress of the North. An imperial power whose greatness was both feared and admired. The Baltic was a Swedish lake controlled by Stockholm. The Swedish Empire included Finland and the provinces of Karelia, Estonia, Ingria and Livonia. It also had footholds in northern Germany, with the most prominent being western Pomerania and the seaports of Setin, Stralsund and Wismar. Sweden had a population of about 1.5 million but it did possess probably the finest army in Europe at the time, known as the Karelian Army. The Swedish infantry of the Karelian Army, magnificent in their blue uniforms with yellow facings, were armed with the latest flintlock muskets. They also had a relatively new innovation, the socket bayonet, which allowed a musket to be fired when attached, unlike the common plug bayonet that was jammed into the muzzle making the musket useless for firing afterwards. Swedish power brought enemies as well as friends. Augustus the Strong, Elector of Saxony and King of Poland-Lithuania, cast covetous eyes on some of Sweden's Baltic lands. King Frederick IV of Denmark-Norway, another potential foe, wanted to reclaim territory his country lost to Sweden earlier in the century. But the Tsardom of Russia was going to be the Swedish Empire's most dangerous enemy, though few believed this in 1700. After a long slumber lasting several centuries, the Russian bear was at last awakening from its self-imposed hibernation. Tsar Peter I, known to history as Peter the Great, 
admired the West and was determined to modernize a still largely medieval country. Peter knew that Russia needed an ice-free port, a window to the West if the country was ever to be accepted as an equal among the great powers of Europe. The Russians were blocked from going south by the weakening but still powerful Ottoman Empire. In the north, the Baltic coast was controlled by Sweden. Peter believed if the Swedes were simultaneously attacked on several fronts, their military power might well be neutralized. The secret allies began preparations for war. 18-year-old King Charles XII seemed a stripling youth. They misread their man. He was a born soldier, reveling in military hardships and dangers. The Great Northern War began on February 22, 1700, when Augustus invaded the Swedish province of Livonia without a formal declaration of war. The Danes also invaded the Duke of holstein gottorps territory just south of their own country. The Duke was a Swedish ally and also a cousin of King Charles. Charles took the news of the outbreak of hostilities calmly. He called for his council and announced his intentions. I have resolved, Charles said, never to start an unjust war, but also never ending a just war without overcoming my enemy. Augustus has broken his word. Our cause, then, is just, and God will help us. The young king began planning a counter-offensive against his enemies. Augustus's Saxon army was besieging Riga in Livonia. However, the Swedes there were holding firm. A Dano-Norwegian army was besieging Turning in holstein gottorp Charles decided that the Danes would be his first target. Charles planned to land troops on Zealand. If he landed there and took Copenhagen behind Frederick IV's back, the Danes would sue for peace. The Swedes embarked for Zealand on June 16th. They rendezvoused with an Anglo-Dutch fleet, which was key to any success against the Danes. King William III of England wanted a quick victory to stabilize the region. Only then could he focus on his main foe, King Louis XIV of France. The combined Allied fleet now numbered 60 ships against 40 Danish men of war. The Danish fleet withdrew. While the Allied fleet commenced a bombardment of Copenhagen, on August 4th, Charles's army landed at Homlebeck, north of the capital. They secured a foothold on the beach and moved towards Copenhagen. Frederick soon interrupted his campaign and started peace talks. On August 18th, the Peace of Travendal was signed. Per the treaty, Denmark-Norway would no longer support the anti-Swedish coalition. Meanwhile, Augustus's Saxon army lifted the siege of Riga and withdrew into early winter quarters. Within months, Denmark-Norway had been decisively knocked out of the war, leaving Saxony to fight on their own. Or so it seemed. Tsar Peter soon declared war on Sweden with the aim of recovering the lost provinces of Ingria and Karelia. First, Peter would try to take Narva, a coastal fortress on the border of Ingria. The Russian army was new and hastily trained. There were only four well-trained modern regiments in the Russian army, the Guards' regiments. They would have to be the foundation on which the rest of the Russian forces would be built. By mid-September, Prince Ivan Trubitskoy, governor of Novgorod, received orders to march on Narva and invest the city with an advance guard of 8,000 men. Command was given to Fyodor Golovin. Under Golovin, the Russian army was divided into three divisions, led by Avtonom Golovin, Adam Ved, and Anikita Retnin. In all, the Russian army totaled over 63,000 men, but the troops were widely scattered. By October 4th, trenches were built before Narva, and Peter arrived to oversee the siege. He only awaited the arrival of cannonballs and gunpowder to begin the bombardment. 
Narva was heavily fortified, with stout walls punctuated by bastions, each bristling with cannon. It was nestled securely on the west bank of the Narva River. Across the river and linked to Narva by bridge was the former Russian fortress of Ivangorod, a relic of the time when the area was a border frontier. Narva was going to be a tough nut to crack. Under the direction of Ludwig Nikolaus von Hallert, a Saxon engineer lent to Peter by Augustus, the Russians established siege lines opposite the land walls of Narva. The Russians entrenched themselves between double walls. These walls developed into earthworks four miles long, nine feet high, with a trench six feet deep in front. The siege moved slower than Peter desired. The meager roads caused the transport wagons and supply trains to bog down. It was not until the end of October that most of Golovin's troops were in position. The Russian bombardment against Narva began on November the 4th. Meanwhile, Count Boris Sheremitev was sent westward with 5,000 horsemen to report any Swedish rescue force. For two weeks, Russian cannons battered Narva with little success. By November 17th, there was insufficient ammunition to continue the bombardment, and the guns were silenced until new supplies could arrive. Meanwhile, two distressing reports arrived in Peter's camp. Augustus had lifted the siege of Riga, and, most worryingly, Charles had landed with a Swedish army on the Baltic coast, 150 miles southwest of Narva. Shortly after the signing of the Peace of Travendal, Charles transferred his army back to Sweden. There, he decreed he would launch a campaign to relieve Narva, much to the dismay of his generals, who advised him against conducting a winter campaign. Charles ignored them, ordering his troops to embark on ships once more and ferrying them across the stormy waters of the Baltic in early October to Perno in the Bay of Riga. Once there, Charles concentrated his available troops. He estimated he could amass 7,000 infantry and 8,000 cavalry by November. At dawn on November 23rd, the expedition set out. There were 10,537 men in all. Conditions were appalling. Roads were mired by fall rains, and the men marched and slept in thick mud. There was no food except what they carried in their knapsacks. A steady, cold November rain drenched them to the skin. At night, the rain turned to snow and sleet. Despite the weather, the Swedes found their march almost unopposed. Two of the three passes along the road were occupied with no opposition. On the fourth day, the advanced Swedish cavalry screen rode into the Pohyorgi Pass, 18 miles west of Narva. 5,000 Russian horsemen commanded by Shiremitev waited on the far side of the pass. A brief skirmish took place, and the Russians retreated back toward Narva. The road to Narva now lay open. The following afternoon, the army reached the village of Lagena, about seven miles from Narva. Unsure if Narva was holding out, Charles ordered the firing of a prearranged signal of four cannon shots. Soon, four cannon sounds replied from the beleaguered fortress. Narva was still in Swedish hands. Peter called his officers into a war council. Additional rounds of ammunition were served out and sentry vigilance doubled, but that night and the next passed peacefully. At 3 a.m. on the 28th, the Tsar summoned the Duke de Croix, a veteran imperial general and nobleman who was with the army as an observer on behalf of Augustus, and asked him to take command. Peter and Golovin were leaving immediately for Novgorod to discuss with Augustus the future conduct of the war. Now de Croix was asked to take command. He argued he would have difficulty issuing orders and ensuring that his commands were obeyed. De Croix was not happy with the disposition of the Russian troops. The line of circumvallation around the city was too long, and the Russian forces were scattered too thinly along its length. 
A strong Swedish attack on one section of the line might easily succeed before troops from other sections could be brought to help. Nevertheless, under strong persuasion from the Tsar, the Khoa consented to take command. Peter's written instructions were to postpone a battle until more ammunition could arrive, but to maintain the siege and prevent Charles's army from breaking into the town. No one in the Russian camp had an inkling of what was about to happen. At dawn on the morning of November 30th, 1700, the Swedes mustered at Lagena and moved toward Narva. By 10 a.m., the vanguard of the army reached the Hermansberg Ridge and became visible to the watching Russians. The Kwa was in the middle of his morning inspection when he realized the Swedes were approaching. He rode up and saw the enemy emerging in columns from atop the ridge. The Kwa ordered his Russian regiments to plant their standards along the earthworks, stand to arms, and wait. Meanwhile, Charles and Count Karl Gustav Rienhult were standing atop Hermansburg Ridge, sweeping their own telescopes up and down the Russian lines. The defensive fortifications appeared impressive. A ditch backed by an earth rampart studded with chevaux de frise. Along the earthworks, separate bastions had been constructed, each lined with cannon. The Russian army inside the camp was obviously much larger than the Swedish force. Nevertheless, it was also clear from the activity that could be observed inside the Russian camp that no sortie was coming. To remain inert in the face of an enemy this size was impossible. To retreat, equally impossible. The only solution seemed to be assault. A concentrated assault on one section of the line might pierce it before sufficient reinforcements could be brought up. Charles therefore ordered Rienhult to attack, and the general quickly worked out a plan. The Battle of Narva had begun. The Swedish infantry was to deliver the main blow. Divided into two divisions, the infantry would assault the earthworks near the center of the line. Once over the walls, the divisions were to separate, one turning north, the other south, rolling up the Russian line from within and driving the Russians toward the river. Swedish cavalry would remain outside the earthworks, controlling the ground there, covering the flanks of the infantry as it advanced and dealing with any attempted Russian sortie or escape. Count Rienhult would command the left wing of the Swedish infantry attack. Count Otto Velinke would command the right. Charles himself was to lead a small force on the far left, in the company of Magnus Stienbock and Arvid Horn. As soon as the guns were unlimbered, the Swedish artillery opened a mass bombardment along the middle of the Russian line, while the infantry assembled in the center and the cavalry squadrons trotted out to the wings. Thus, in a calm and orderly way, 10,000 Swedes prepared to advance on 40,000 strongly entrenched Russians. The attack plan was to have the Swedish infantry columns approach the siege lines in a company attack pattern. The battalions would be organized into a six-rank deep formation. About one-third of the men were pikemen, equipped with 18-foot-long pikes. In this formation, the Swedish musketeers would march in the front and back of the lines. Grenadiers would be on the flanks of the musketeers. By 2 p.m., when the Swedes were ready to attack, the rain stopped. It had grown colder and a new storm was gathering in the darkened sky. Just as signal rockets soared up, setting the army in motion, a blizzard roared in from behind, sweeping snow horizontally toward the Russian lines. Some of the Swedish officers hesitated, wanting to postpone the attack until the storm was over. No, cried Charles. The snow is at our backs, but it is full in the enemy's face. Silently, swiftly, the Swedes advanced, suddenly looming before the enemy out of the snow. For a moment, the Russians looked around and all seemed quiet. Then the Swedes emerged from the blizzard before their very eyes like ghosts. Thirty paces in front of the earthworks, the Swedish line suddenly halted. 
A single volley rung out, and the Russians fell like grass. Throwing their fascines into the ditch, the Swedes swarmed across, moving on top of them. They climbed over the earthworks and threw themselves on the foe. Within 15 minutes, a fierce hand-to-hand -hand battle was taking place inside the works. The Russians fought stubbornly at first. However, a breach had been made through which fresh Swedish infantry now poured in. The two Swedish divisions separated and drove the Russians back along the inside of the earthworks in opposite directions. Since the Russian line of defense was a full four miles long, they could not take advantage of their numerical superiority. Within ten minutes, Swedish regimental flags were waving over the captured Ratshof Redoubt. Russian cavalry on the right panicked, and they fled across the river. About 1,000 riders drowned in the strong current of the freezing, swollen river. The Swedes surged forward, cutting down Russian stragglers. On the enemy right, the Russians attempted a stand, at first defending themselves bravely. As their officers fell, panic set in, and they fled, crying, the Germans have betrayed us. A large part of the Russian left fled. As the Swedish advance continued northward, the mass of fleeing Russians on the right grew. Soon a dense herd of terrified soldiers was stampeding to escape over the single bridge over the Narva River, the Kamperholm Bridge. The bridge cracked and sagged under their weight, sending men sliding and tumbling into the river, where hundreds drowned. The Russians now became furious with their foreign officers and began massacring them. The Kwa declared, the devil could not fight with such soldiers, and, along with Halat, made his way toward the Swedish line and surrendered to Stienbock. Command fell to Yakov Delgaryukov, who collected the rabble of the Russian right next to the collapsed Kamperholm Bridge. The Russians built a wagon fort, defended by six battalions, including men from the elite Priobrazhensky and Semyonovsky regiments, under overall command of Dolgoryukov and Ivan Buteryin. Barricading themselves, they fought back vigorously against the Swedes. Except for this single stand, the Russians had been reduced to a confused, fleeing rabble. As darkness fell over the battlefield just before 6 p.m., Charles appeared inside the works, covered with mud and lacking a boot. He found that although the Kwa and most of the foreign officers had surrendered, and most of the Russian army had disintegrated, victory was still not secure. The battle against the carriage castle and the Russians' main army camp did not end until 11 p.m., when Dolgoryukov and the Russian right wing finally surrendered. In the darkness of the night, the weary and starving Swedish soldiers plundered the rich Russian stores in the camp. Near 11.15 p.m., the king gave the order to cease firing. Charles opened negotiations with the Russian officers. They arranged for the soldiers to keep their muskets and small arms while the officers became prisoners of war. Charles took possession of the regimental standards and all the artillery. He ordered the Russian prisoners to repair the sagging Kamperholm Bridge. At 4 a.m., the bridge repairs were complete. In a long procession, Russian troops marched past the bridge, guarded by Swedish troops who stood as a long avenue through which the Russian troops were forced to march. Swedish losses were 31 officers and 646 men killed, along with 1,205 wounded. Losses on the other side could only be estimated, even by the Russians themselves. At least 8,000 had been killed or wounded, and the wounded stood little chance of getting home across the now freezing countryside. Ten Russian generals, ten colonels and 33 other senior officers were held as prisoners. The Swedes captured 145 guns, 32 mortars, four howitzers, 10,000 cannonballs, and 397 barrels of powder. Peter's army was now effectively stripped of the Tsar's favorite weapon. 
On December 2nd, Charles and the troops entered Narva, where they celebrated their victory. News of the decisive Swedish victory made a sensational impression throughout Europe. But the Great Northern War had only just begun. Many years of hard back and forth fighting between the Swedish Empire and the anti-Swedish coalition still lay ahead. For the moment, however, King Charles XII and his elite Carolean army seemed invincible. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as one dollar, or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.